In today's video, we're going to be diving into the upcoming pattern, taking a look at some major storm systems that are going to be moving across the nation, as well as some intense cold fronts that are going to be periodically rolling through. We're going to be in a quicker pattern, so things are going to be going up and down and back and forth much quicker in terms of uh, the amount of days that we're going to be under these air masses. Think in terms of a day to three days instead of a whole week or you know even more of a certain pattern that we're in. It's going to be very very progressive and that is what I expect in the upcoming pattern but for now let's take a look at the current conditions. We will dive into what's happening in the future uh, very soon within the video and we could see two storm systems. One is quite minor as far as the impacts for the United States and the other one is more major than the other. Obviously, we have one here just to the north of the Dakotas, uh, north of North Dakota, better yet. So uh, we have that one that is quite minor, uh, some lighter showers happening throughout those areas. And then we have a much more impactful low over the Mid-Atlantic, Ohio Valley, and the Northeast that we're going to dive into as well. Before we do, let's take a look at this minor one real quickly. And we can see our low is located up here to the north. Um, just near uh, Dauphin, uh, I think that's how you say that, uh, Canada. And as you can see, we're seeing a lot of these showers move generally southward uh, from that low here into North Dakota. Along the cold front, which is relatively dry, we do have a few showers though for Minnesota, Iowa, perhaps Illinois, and soon to be Wisconsin here in a few hours. Looking eastward though at our more major system, we can see a lot of dynamics at play uh, as we have our low here over Pennsylvania. Um, we have an occluded front, as you can see, up until about Delaware, New Jersey, and then we split to where we have a cold front and a warm front out here to the east. Now, I think this is relatively outdated, in my opinion. Uh, these tend to be, but I think that our low is more like up here, and I would argue that we have a bit of a warm front dynamic happening there. Um, and... It's hard to, this is just hard to break down, but there's a lot of moving pieces here. We can see showers also kind of diving southward slash eastward underneath and to the west of the low there. And those are impacting states like Michigan, Ohio, Kentucky, West Virginia here. Uh, funny enough, Pennsylvania is probably the driest state up here uh, and, and the low is over them. Uh, but we can see some heavier activity, especially in eastern Pennsylvania in areas like Scranton, uh, Allentown here and even Philadelphia where we have this band of heavier showers or even thunderstorms that are ongoing there. Looking northward, a lot of like the Finger Lakes region here near Syracuse and everything in New York, we have these showers kind of rising northward uh, and these are light to moderate in nature. Looking eastward, we get our heaviest rainfall actually along that New York, Vermont, Ma Massachusetts and Connecticut border somewhere in there. So we're seeing areas like Albany, uh, we're seeing Burlington up here in Vermont dealing with this. Uh, we see all the way southward like uh, Hartford, Connecticut. Or Hartford, I don't know how you pronounce it. I think Hartford. Uh, Bridgeport, Connecticut as well. All dealing with these heavier showers. And these are going to be moving eastward. So expect to see more of Vermont seeing these later on. Even New Hampshire. Uh, more central and eastern Massachusetts. As well as Rhode Island a little bit later on. As these are generally heading northeast easterly so there is some easterly motion with these and they will be uh, slowly sliding eastward and still very very impactful these are coming from uh, offshore so they are bringing very very rich amounts of rainfall onshore to the southern new england areas uh, really much needed rainfall and quite heavy at that let's go ahead and move into the model guidance though and see what we do have upcoming now, as we take a look at the past 30 days, uh, we will look at this again tomorrow on Halloween, uh, but it does look like we're pretty locked in for this being the final temperature anomalies for October, below normal temperatures along the west, neutral to slightly below normal temperatures here in the east, and then above normal temperatures here throughout the central states. Now, it's funny, I'm mentioning above and below normal temperatures. I actually saw a comment come through yesterday on my video where somebody was like, you know, you shouldn't call it below normal temperatures because this time of year our average temperatures or our normal temperatures range from, let's, I forget exactly what he said for his area, but let's say it's like 40 and 70 degrees, right? 40 being the, low, the average low temperature and then up at 70 being the average high temperature. Uh, now, while it's, 
obvious if you look at the whole day, right, the whole day, uh, yeah, you can see a range of those temperatures and anything within there would be considered normal, of course. Uh, but the important caveat is that when we're looking at this, we're talking about the averages of the whole day. And it's taking into account the low temperatures and the high temperatures. So if the high was 60 and it's typically 70, that's 10 degrees below normal for the high temperature. And let's say it was 30 degrees instead of 40 degrees. Well, that's 10 degrees below normal on the low temperature. So it's important to differentiate that. Obviously, um, you know, you could kind of cherry pick it to where it's like, oh, it was, it was 50 degrees out today, but typically we range from 40 to whatever, because you're picking the high temperature as like the average. And then you're taking what's normal as anywhere between the average low and the average high. But if the high temperature is really close to the average low temperature, then that's a really, really low high. Um, so I think that was important to kind of clarify there. Uh, when we're seeing Below normal temperatures on this screen, it is below what is typical. And if we're seeing the oranges, it is above typical. It's above normal for this time of year. Let's take a look here at the model guidance. We can see our big storm there in the east. And as we just kind of move this towards tomorrow, so Halloween afternoon, we'll move this, we'll inch this forward in a moment to see kind of the, the trick-or-treating time. But we can see some lighter showers up here in the northern plains, upper Midwest. I even think I see some snow showers there over western uh, North Dakota, very interesting. This low is more so located in northern Maine, so we still continue to see showers for the northeast corner of the nation as well as southeastern uh, Canada. Mostly this is going to be for the more northern areas of New York, the more northern areas of Vermont, the more northern areas of New Hampshire, and you guessed it, the more northern areas of Maine. Uh, so the more interior regions of the northeast, in other words, still seeing showers into the late afternoon, afternoon slash late afternoon here. This is like 5 p.m. And as we move towards 8 p.m., which I feel like it, it's been a while since I've trick-or-treated, you guys, but I feel like um, this is probably when people start doing that around eight, nine. And we can see still some impacts here for the interior northeastern states, even some snowfall perhaps for the Adirondack Mountains. And that's going to be for the very high elevations in there. And we do see a passing sprinkle or two. This does look like really light activity for the Dakotas, Nebraska, Iowa, Minnesota, Wisconsin, the UP of Michigan here. Uh, and other than that, it's relatively dry until you reach into in towards western uh, Washington there as well as extreme northwestern Oregon, where we are seeing pretty heavy and consistent rainfall there in those Pacific Northwest locations. With the Halloween outlook out of the way, let's move towards the afternoon of our first day of November here, Saturday. And we can see that we get a little bit of an expanded storm over the northwest, where this is becoming a little bit more um, impactful to a wider region. We do see in this trough that is moving into the east, we see some lighter showers for the upper Midwest, again, into the Great Lakes, the lower Midwest, the Ohio Valley, even into the deep south here. There's some sprinkles and very light showers passing through these areas. And obviously, when we look at our jet stream, it's a big ridge in the west and a big trough here over mostly the central states, but it is moving into the eastern states here. And by Sunday here on the 2nd of November, we see that trough is mostly located over the eastern states now. This is what we were talking about yesterday, where this ridge, instead of building a, a vertical ridge over the west, it kind of spreads out and becomes very, very wide for a lot of your western and central states. And that kind of blocks out a lot of the Arctic air being able to dive into the eastern states, because typically they're coming from the northwest and moving into the east. But if we have this warmer uh, air mass kind of encroaching, it might just force the colder air to kind of circle away out of this area it's kind of blocking us out of seeing that coldest coldest air that we could potentially see and that's been a very recent trend monday it does break through a bit as you can see it flattens out the jet stream it's able to work its way around the ridge we actually do end up with a pretty decent dip over the east here and even a coastal low that's pretty well offshore but it's interesting to note that that is forming along the very eastern front there of that trough now, as we keep going towards Tuesday here on the 4th of November, we see that the east is relatively quiet. It's still a trough. It's pretty minor, but it is still there. The west is seeing quite a bit more activity, especially along that northwest coastline and the northern Rockies there, where, again, even high elevation areas are seeing snowfall. Wednesday the 5th here, uh, we get a couple of interesting things. We have heavier precipitation 
now. So it's actually getting worse, the storm out west for Washington, Oregon, Idaho, and even northern California. And then we get this very interesting system over the Great Lakes that looks a lot more like a clipper system. So it's not obviously wintertime, so this isn't going to be like a snow event, an all-snow event at least. Uh, but we do see that this is very, very reminiscent of what we expect to see with clippers. Maybe a sign of things to come for the wintertime. Who knows? But it is interesting to say the least. And that's moving over the UP of Michigan. And then it relatively, uh, for, for most of the storm, is staying north of the U.S.-Canada border. Uh, but it does slip down into New England here at the very tail end. This is for Thursday afternoon on the 6th. We do end up seeing quite a bit of snowfall, especially in Canada from this one. But the United States mostly deals with rainfall, unless you're in far northern Maine, which is more like Canada climate-wise anyway. Uh, we oftentimes see northern Maine have a much different, um, you know, precipitation type than areas further south than it. So it's a pretty interesting spot in the United States. And this low is pretty hefty, 994. You can see this is a wide-spanning impacts from this storm. Pretty interesting. The west stays active here, so nothing's changed too much out there. Friday on the 7th, we get the Northwest continuing to be active. A new low starting to form over the plains here between Kansas and Oklahoma. And we can see some showers, perhaps even thunderstorms out there. And even though we don't have a major trough in the United States, there's still more of a ridge look in the, in the West compared to the East. But it's a very soft ridge and trough, which means the conditions out here aren't going to be too far off from what we're seeing in the East. It's relatively flat. As we keep going, we do get this low, actually a tandem team of lows here. We had one up here. It ends up transferring its energy to this one further southeast. Regardless, we end up with some pretty broad low pressure across the areas in between the Great Lakes and the Hudson Bay. And this is what allows another colder air mass to move into the eastern states as we approach the 10th time frame of November, which is quite far out. Um, that's about 11 days out, so take it with a grain of salt. But this has been the trend on both of these models so far. The Northwest continuing to see activity here. And as a result of this storm system, the Great Lakes, Mid-Atlantic, and Northeast end up seeing some rainfall. As we keep going, uh, towards Monday afternoon on November 10th here, we were looking at the kind of, you know, very early morning hours of Monday before, but we end up seeing, again, cooler in the east, warmer in the west. As time goes on, Tuesday the 11th, the Northwest is getting battered with more precipitation. And as the days kind of continue, we get another cold front. Watch this form. So we end up with this low. You probably can't see it on screen, but it's to the north of North Dakota and Montana here, 996. And it forms a cold front, and it just pulls all of that activity uh, into the eastern states. Look at this warm nose. We call it a warm nose. Just to the east of that low in that cold front where warmer air is being shoved northward, we have a warm front dynamic here that's also aiding and pulling everything up. Uh, that's kind of your dynamics at play here. And then we see that cold front just scrape along the nation. As you can see, high precipitation, probably thunderstorms on the more th southern extent of that. And the northwest sees another storm system move in. That's the tail end of the model run. So take these particular details with a grain of salt, but interesting to see. Total precipitation has trended down the further south you are in the east. But we do see a nice amounts in the northeast and mid-Atlantic as well as the Great Lakes. The Northwest has probably doubled the amount of precipitation that this model thinks they're going to have overnight. I mean, that is crazy, crazy amounts. And it makes sense because it never really stopped, you know, having a storm there. The whole model run, it just seemed like it was constant uh, precipitation. Looking at the anomalies, we can see well above average amounts here in the Northwest. Very reminiscent of a La Nina, which we do sort of have a La Nina at play and drier in the southwest which is also reminiscent of a la nina we do have a drier deeper south which can happen at times during these la nina events but uh this has just been continuously happening for months now and then again as we reach the great lakes in northeast in particular uh we are above average if not at the worst very slightly below average and most of that is for the upper midwest and great lakes here the northeast does uh pretty well as far as precipitation here Total snowfall. Uh, out west, we do see really, really large amounts for the Cascades especially, but also the Sierra Nevada and Rocky Mountain ranges. And that is because of that continuous storminess. We do end up seeing uh, a bit of snowfall for the mountainous northeast. Uh, that happens this time of year. It makes sense. Um, but I don't expect too much in the way of snowfall reaching the lower elevations of these areas. This is mostly exclusive for mountaintop locations. 
temperatures here. As we just take a look at the European model, we're colder right now, and we're going to stay colder for quite a while here. Sunday the 2nd, Monday the 3rd, Tuesday the 4th. As you can see, it's still around for the eastern seaboard at least. And then Wednesday the 5th, it finally moves out when we see warmer than normal conditions move in. That lasts through the 6th. And then we get another cold front that rolls through for the 7th and the 8th there for parts of the Mid-Atlantic and Northeast. And then we warm up again for a day or two, or three, and then we get some cooler air moving in uh, along the East Coast. And then right here at the end of the model run, this is when we have that cold front rolling in. So that's the cold air that would follow it as it moves towards the East. Very interesting, still very cold considering we don't have any major troughs really uh, happening after this current one. Um, we do see the one after the 10th actually on that model run that does look pretty nice, but uh, that is very cold considering the pattern that we have. The GFS model is going to be much colder than the European model though. Uh, we see this cold again continue into the 5th, 6th in this model, and then we get the next cold air mass uh, there around the 6th, 7th, 8th, and then we get another major trough around the 10th there, and then another coming in for the 12th, 13th, 14th, 15th here. So a much colder model run with more severely cold air on the GFS model. And notice the difference. Uh, we have warmer air stacked vertically in the west again. And that just allows for this colder air to pour into the central and eastern states. We're missing that vertical column of warmth out west on the European model, but we are not missing it on the GFS model. And that is the, bigger, the biggest difference here between the two and why we get different results here on the model. With all that being said, be sure to subscribe. We upload every single day. You can even hit the bell icon for daily notifications when we upload so you never miss one. Be sure to like the video if you did enjoy it. Leave a comment down below, and I'll see you guys in the next video.